Where's everybody there? What are you doing? Just where did the devil Okay. All good dollars. All right. Place to start. Yeah. yeah. Um, marketing and fundraising. Marketing and fundraising? It's an election office. Election office. That's oh. interesting. That's all we need. Okay. All right, cool. So one of the things I like to point out when going on this journey is it's going to be hard. It's frustrating, right? Programming is like unlike anything you've ever done before, right? So one of the things that I like to promote right at the beginning, especially um, people who are just breaking into this, is expect some frustrating moments. Embrace it and work with it, okay? If you get frustrated, that means you're trying something new, okay? So I don't want you guys to give up the first time, time sign at something getting hard. That means you're trying, you're trying something you haven't done before. So I highly encourage you to keep going with it. Um, today we're going to be talking about these topics. If we get to all of them, cool, right? We only have an hour time. Uh, if we don't get to all of them, just as cool. The lectures are broken down all the same. So I'd start off with an introduction, give you some examples, and then we dive right into a, a quick code example. If you don't have a laptop, that's just as fine. You can follow these um, and, and do... Oh, don't go there. That link is dead. It is that file. So one, one hour intro. All right. Oh. It'll come up again. Yeah. Bitly. One hour intro. So, uh, put it on the message on the yep. meetup. So hi, I'm Jeremy. Nice to meet everybody. I've been in the industry for about 15 years. I currently work at a company called Aero Digital, where I'm the uh, platforms manager. I run the team of front-end developers. Um, I run meetups, as I talked about just a few minutes ago. I co-organized the Boca JS and co-organized the Palm Beach JS. Um, we organize hackathons here at Palm Beach Tech. Does anybody know what a hackathon is? What do you guys think a hackathon is? Raise your hand. What do you think it is? Uh, <laughs> no? What do you think it is? Hack into it. Okay. All right. Cool. What do you think of this? I think it's um, that you set a team of several different position roles, like developer, designer, mm -hmm. and um, you have either a project, it could be for like, a community or your own, to mm -hmm. create a minimal viable partner. Okay. An MVP. Very mm -hmm. cool. So that's a little bit more of an accurate representation of it. So it's like people usually have the connotation of like, I'm going to hack into your email and I'm going to get your information. Or I'm going to hack in to some sensitive area, some server or something, I'm going to get your information. That's not what this is all about. Hacking is a term of just quickly rambling something together to bring up an MVP. So we organize a uh, hackathon and we typically benefit nonprofits that are technology hungry. Right. So last, uh, last hackathon we benefited um, the STEM Council of Palm Beach County. Right. They, they needed some help. They were hungry for technology. So they came out and pitched three ideas to us, and the participants all gathered their resources together, some designers, some developers, some project managers, and they built something for that. And then at the end, they were judged based on uh, viability, completeness, and uh, uh, other factors, and ultimately won cash prizes. And the year before that, we did something really cool for the River Center up in uh, uh, Jupiter. So there, there's a lot of cool stuff that uh, comes out. Be sure to check out palmbeachtech.org and uh, sign up for us. Uh, at check the blogs. We'll be doing another one here soon. Um, so that's enough about me. I like to start off with what is computer programming? Right? Because it confuses people sometimes. Uh, computer programming is the art of telling computer what to do. Computers are tools that are utilized to solve problems. They take a very specific set of instructions and they do a very specific set of things. That's it. And I, I like to point out this word. It's the art of telling it what to do. Some people say it's a science. But I say this is the more creative side of the science and whatnot. I mentioned that, right? It's going to be frustrating. Embrace it. Oh, it is. It is going to be uh, a fun journey if you understand that it's going to be frustrating and you work past it. There, I don't. I can't tell you how many days I feel like that. Damon, do you feel like I just pushing the screw it? I'm done like that right now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Yes, absolutely. <laughs> hey, do you, do you before we, we dive in, we just like, really quick say who, who the people are here? Who the people are here? I mean, oh, I, I introduced them. You, 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 you introduced yourselves. I, I, he wasn't here yet. Okay. He just popped Yeah. So, it, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I'm, I'm Greg. Uh, I do assistant work with him when I occasionally show up late, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm here 
job today. So we, we do, um, we started a nonprofit organization uh, called Code Palm Beach where we teach kids to uh, program. And it's school age children between the ages of 8 and 14. And uh, we meet once a, or twice a month and at the Palm Beach, uh, or the Science Center and the Abacoa STEM Center. And uh, we just spend an hour and a half with the students trying to figure out how to teach them how to code. Um, and Greg and I are, are sitting on the education committee where we're building tools to help facilitate that whole thing. And we also do uh, code creations, which is a um, project initiative at the Science Center where it's geared toward that, where uh, they come once a weekend uh, for a month. And uh, we teach them how to code there as well. And then this is uh, Joe Russo. I mentioned the Palm Beach Tech and the Palm Beach Tech space. This is the brains behind it. This is uh, the guy who's bringing this all together. Definitely not brains. <laughs> Definitely not. I would put it that way. Well, it wasn't the look, so we have to choose one. <laughs> oh, I, I, you know what? There's people I don't know here, so I'm going to be nice and not have contact. Just know it's up here. Glass, glass, um, glass door. Yeah. Glass house. And a quick preface um, for those interested in the Win Code uh, program that will be had here. Jeremy's going to be the gentleman who's leading that program. Uh, he's an instructor who's worked uh, several years as an instructor, but also is a, uh, a, a software developer by day over at a company here called Aero Digital. Greg works at a company called AR Design, which uh, does a lot of creative and marketing type work with a very small team of five uh, gentlemen and lady uh, down in Boynton Beach. Damien over here has been in development for over 20 years. Um, he coded back when they uh, used typewriters to write the code. <laughs> I've been coding punch so cards. long that once I, I coded a database with just zeros. No one. <laughs> but, no one invented yet. But these are, the, these are the type of gentlemen who are out there trying to teach others about coding and development in the community and try and get a new generation of people to work with them uh, the in the field. And also, of course, teach. Uh, kids on, yes. uh, on a consistent basis. So I, I want to make sure everybody realized that these aren't just random guys who are coming in and, and talking about He gave about me coding. 20 bucks and I just showed up. <laughs> 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 you don't know something about JavaScript? <laughs> <laughs> oh, the homers. They need work too. But anyway, folks with years of experience and a passion for what they do. I, I just want to make sure they were recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, so for applause, okay. For those of you who just came in, uh, check out that bit.ly. Uh, you can download the slides and the uh, starter files. Um, so one, one quick caveat, uh, you're never unemployed, you're currently freelancing. Right? So Damien is currently freelancing. I'm a consultant. A consultant, that's the term. So you're never unemployed, you're freelancing. So, uh, Lydica didn't hire me, I don't know why. <laughs> um, so the first thing I want to talk about is setting up your proper uh, development environment. Right? What do I mean by development environment? Um, the editor you choose, the tools you debug your stuff with, where you write your code is your development environment. How your folder is structured, all of those things go into there. And it's important to have a developer environment that works for you, not against you. Right? What editors uh, have you used? Uh, who who raised their hand for coding? What editors do you use? Um, right now, I'm using VS Code. VS Code, yeah. love it. <laughs> what else? Adam. Adam, all right. I like it. Muse. Do you? Muse. Muse? Muse? Mm -hmm. Webstorm. Webstorm. I like Webstorm. Sublime. Sublime. Okay. We're going to upgrade you here soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to upgrade you as well. <laughs> um, absolutely. So JetBrains is a tool that I used to use all the time. It was a nice IDE where I was involved only in that. Um, there, there's a tool I like to use uh, called VS Code, right? So I heard one out there. So um, if you guys haven't made the switch, I highly, highly, highly recommend doing so. Um, it's just an awesome editor. It's nice and lightweight. It opens up real quick, and it's extensible, right? It's not really good for, like, IntelliSense or JavaScript is really poor. If you're well, using not my TypeScript, the TypeScript it works great, but not we struggle with, with using VS Code for, like, writing for practice. <coughs> So a lot of a lot of the stuff like, so. yeah, <laughs> a, a lot of the stuff that I use uh, IntelliSense is built in, so maybe I'm not using that, that particular plugin, you know, that, that's out there because the maybe whole you third could party. Show us something so we can we'll save sixty dollars next year. <laughs> <laughs> um, so VS Code, check it out, play with it, learn it. Um, on my GitHub page, 
uh, there's you're going to see uh, I have my when I pull up my VS Code you're going to see I chose a particular set of fonts I chose a particular set of colors I've got plugins that help you know my day to day life and whatnot so if you want to see what I'm doing uh, go look there um, the other the other part of your uh, tool your developer environment is what browser to use Chrome okay yeah. Firefox. The, the answer is all of them, really, right? So the fact that we have all these different major browser vendors, we need to test in all of those browsers in order to see what is actually happening. That being said, I develop mainly in Chrome because their developer tools are top notch, right? They're, they're second to none. Um, Firefox is a good alternative. They're decent. I just fell off the bandwagon a long time ago after they took away Firebug from me and moved to Chrome and have never looked back. Um, but they're if you want to get into something called CSS Grid, Firefox has the best uh, dev tool for that. So the point of the, uh, bringing up the development environment is what I'm using is not what you're going to be using. And I don't care. What, you, what I recommend and what I care about more is that you love the tool and you learn it and you utilize it to the best of your advantage. So if, if NetBeans is working for you, stick with it. Don't change. Right? If Sublime is working for you, stick with it. Don't change. I'm choosing and advocating for VS Code. I started off with Atom for a while and then moved to VS Code because everybody told me to and I haven't regretted it since. So that's why I highly recommend it. There are the files again. So intro to JavaScript. Where does it fit, right? We need to think about like the layers of the web and I'm gonna talk about the web from when it's in our browser, right? Known as the client. So whatever browser we're looking at in Chrome, IE, Firefox, Safari, whatever, that's known as the client. And there are three major layers. We have our HTML, which is our structure, right? We have our CSS, which is our style, our paint. And then we have JavaScript. JavaScript handles everything, uh, like form validation, mouse interactions, animations, 2D, 3D stuff. Anything that you see you're interacting with that other than a simple hover state on a button, that's probably JavaScript. You can think of it like this. <laughs> That's my game. Like he told me that my game with, with, with okay, slides, with gifts. That's my game with gifts. <laughs> Alright, so we've talked about our development environment. We've talked about what uh, tools we're going to be using as far as developing and editing. There's a, um, a big chunk of figuring out how to use the developer tools. I highly recommend checking out the um, the Chrome uh, developer log because Chrome updates every six weeks and they add new stuff to the console all the time right so i highly recommend checking out their youtube series because they break down not only the new features uh, on on the six week cycle but they have a great introduction to how to debug and use their uh, developer tools so i highly recommend checking that out programming 101 syntax right, we, we cannot start this conversation without talking about syntax in computer science syntax of a language is a set of rules that defines the combinations and symbols that are considered to be correctly structured. Right? We've seen syntax all over, right? We all speak various languages and we have commas when appropriate, we have periods where appropriate, we use the semicolons in certain situations, and they have rules that dictate how this language is supposed to be structured. HTML, CSS, and JavaScript is no different in this context. One of the concepts I hope to convey as we move forward through this is that I'm going to be teaching you programming. The language I'm choosing is JavaScript. The reason I choose JavaScript to teach programming is because you need a text editor and a web browser and you can start programming. But if you can sit back and absorb the bigger concepts, a condition statement, a for loop, a block of code, those things are going to translate over to every programming language you're ever going to touch. The difference is, is going to be syntax. Does that make sense? Cool. Comments. Comments are a beautiful thing. They are a special syntax that you could leave in your code that can either uh, comment out a chunk of information that uh, is not read by the parser, by the uh, computer. Right? When I say parsing, the program, uh, uh, Chrome is going to read your code. It's going to start at the top read to the right, go to the next line, read to the right, go to the next line, read to the right. It's parsing your code. If I want a particular section of my code to not be executed by my, uh, by my engine, by my uh, browser, then I comment it out. And this is useful for a, a couple different things. One, 
I can leave a note to myself, right? To do, like do this later. Or I have a nice big chunk of uh, 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 methods and functions, and I want to explain what the parameters are going into it and how to how this function is supposed to work. Right? I can leave a comment to either help uh, another programmer reading my stuff or me in six months because I, I am another programmer in six months. Um, and there's two ways to do it. You have a single line and you have a multi-line. The single line is just slash slash. One thing I like to note about this is wherever your slash slash starts, it's commenting out the right hand side. So everything after the slash slash is what's going to be commented on the single line. And this is useful for if I set a variable that I haven't really clearly defined as, like what the name is, I do a slash slash at the end and be like, this is what the variable is supposed to mean. Right? So I'm not commenting out the whole line, I'm just commenting after the variable. But in the situation where I have a big method where I want to explain to a future developer what that is, I have this comment where I slash asterisk and I end it with an asterisk slash. And that way I can write it on multiple lines. So it's just super powerful. Same way as CSS commentary? The bottom one is. Oh, okay, that's not perfect. Less and SAS do the first one, and that's uh, special to them. Because like, in less and SAS, they, they won't compile that line at all. Mm -hmm. Whereas the bottom one, it's a valid CSS comment, so it will pass through the parser. Okay. So that's the difference. Um, so, for those, how many have downloaded the files and got it extracted and opened in their favorite editor of choice? I should probably mention that. Extract it. There's a projects folder. Inside there, I have comments. Oh, we start with comments. Yeah. So VS Code is the same as Visual Studio Code. Yes. No. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's in Visual Studio. So like I mentioned, we have a final and a start. I want everyone to open up the start file and open up the uh, comments.js. Are we supposed to open them in VS Code? Is that Correct. Okay, because I have to download that I didn't have it on my machine. So. Oh, so whatever text editor you have is, is OK. I just use text edit. Well, yeah, that works. <laughs> Talk to me afterwards, and I'll show you what Visual Studio Code is and some things that you can I use. I see it. I, I started downloading. Thank you. Yeah. So just because, and that's the beauty of uh, JavaScript. All we need is a text editor. It gives me fun things like I can comment out a line just by one click. So the task that I want you to do is uncomment everything and get this program to run. So when you're done, open up the index.html in Chrome. And you should see a simple console log of email, uh, fry at thefuture.com, and a number and a contact phone number. So this, this one, nice little warm up, right? But this is the style where it's like I'm going to introduce a topic, and each topic we're going to talk about is going to build on it. So we're going to. Uh, Who's the directory? Uh, in, the, in the projects folder. So there should be a projects folder in the um, uh, zero zero. Yep. So start off at zero zero.
So if you open up the index.html in your Chrome, there are two ways to open up your uh, developer tools. Um, so on a, and they're they're in the command uh, they're in the uh, description there. So on uh, Mac it's Command Option J, and on PC it's Control Shift J. And what this does is this brings you up the brings up the developer tools. So has anybody ever just like right clicked and inspect element? And you see this panel here where it's like it's the structure of the HTML? Well there's a tab right next to it called console. And that console is where we're gonna be seeing all of our information. That's where you see the server too, right? I'm sorry, what? Servers that's where you see the server too in there. You want to open up to see server uh, sources, yep. requests, uh, Ajax or yep. whatever. Else. We've got our network tab, which sees all the HTTP requests, anything that's being downloaded. There's a good performance tab in here if you want to figure out uh, all the marketing people, if you want to figure out how to make your site faster. There's a um, what they call Lighthouse, and it gives you a burn down of what's slowing down your site. So that's good information to use. So if I wanted to uncomment something, so right now I've got on line one and two, a line comment out. How do I remove that? Just what do I, what do I have to do? Simple as that. So I'm going to do the same thing over here. One of the things I want to stress is proper indentation, please. There's a, there's a big thing where it's like our, our functions are going to start getting a little bit more arrowy, right? We're going to have if statements, we're going to have loops, we're going to start seeing stuff being indented more than one away from the edge, from the left-hand side. So if you uh, do yourself a favor and indent properly, because if you don't, you're going to accidentally miss a curly bracket or a square bracket or something vital, and that's going to be really hard to find. Question. In VS Code, it has a keyboard shortcut. Control Shift F, I like it. And then also another keyboard shortcut is Control or Command question mark. We'll comment and uncomment the line of code. If I have a few highlighted, uh, stop it. If I have a few highlighted, I can comment and uncomment multiple lines at a time. Command or Control question mark. Yeah. Command and slash question mark. Well, you're on a Mac, so it's command. Oh. Command slash. So, no, when I, when I say uh, I'm on a PC, so I'm going to say control a lot, and then I'm going to look at a Mac, and I'm going to be like, yeah, you should do control, but I mean command when I'm looking at a Mac. <laughs> control and command are the same thing in Mac for the most part. But that's it, right? So, we just uncommented some code. Did everybody uh, got it running, got it uh, working? Come back here and refresh the page. Boom. That's it. That's all our program does. Just want to get you guys used to seeing comments. The rest of the lectures will have a big chunk of comments where uh, they're going to explain what I want you guys to do right above the function or just in a big chunk above. So I, that's why I wanted to talk about what comments were. All right. So that, that's, that's as easy as this is going to get. It's going to get harder from here. All right. So just be prepared. All right, um, before I can talk about my next topic, I want to talk about what reserved words are. All right, reserved words in JavaScript are words you can't use. There's a distinct difference between what a reserved word is and a keyword is, but I don't understand them. <laughs> like when I looked at the documentation, there's a distinct difference, but I use them interchangeably. So if it's a reserved word in a good text editor, they'll highlight and italicize and do something a little weird, right? So I wanted to just point out a couple like break, case, catch, the keyword this, right? That's a reserved word you can't use. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because of variables, right? Variables. 
A variable is a name, location, and memory where data can be stored. It's a super technical term, right? The idea behind it is you give the variable a symbolic name that's going to hold some information. You're not going to know necessarily what this information is going to hold at the time you're calling for it, right? So give that variable a meaningful name. Before we can get into naming, we talked about reserved words. We can't use that. There are some other words, uh, um, rules we need to know. When naming a variable, they can only start with a dollar sign, a letter, or an underscore. That's it. That's all they can start with. They can contain a number, but they cannot start with it. Right? If I had user one, like the number one, that's totally cool. But I can't have one user. Right? They cannot contain a dash or a period. What else could that dash symbol mean in anything else? Subtraction. Subtraction, right? So if I separate my word by a dash, I'm trying to subtract the left-hand side from the right-hand side. That doesn't make sense, right? Any guesses as to why uh, I can't have a period in there? Object chain. Objects. Right? So in JavaScript, everything is an object, and we have a set of access to methods and properties. We'll talk about this way later. Right? If you don't get it now, it's fine. But the idea of how I get from my root object to my property or method is using the dot notation. So I cannot store a variable that has a dot in the middle or a dash anywhere in it. And this cannot be a reserved word. Right? The general rule of thumb, so that list I showed you earlier, I don't know all of those words. I, I looked it up, and I even cut it in half because there was a lot there. Right when I looked at MDN. But the idea is, if it, if it italicizes in a funky way, like, uh, like let's take a look at it. So var is a reserved word, right? So I can't do var equals var. That's just not a thing we can do, right? I can't do, uh, so see how false is uh, colored a little differently? I can't use that. I can't do var false equals something, right? So. The idea behind this is uh, we, do, we have three keywords we can utilize. We have the var keyword, we have the let, and we have the const. And we start off with those uh, words, literally typing them out, and then we give it some symbolic name. Right? Is logged in. That's a symbolic name. I don't know if they're going to be logged in or not when I call for it, but I know that I'm, when I use that in my code, that it means something, that I'm going to check to see if they're logged in or not. Does anybody have a, a guess as to what the uh, style of uh, naming I, I gave that? What, what is that called? Camel casing. Camel casing. Why is it camel casing? Because it humps, right? <laughs> so the first word is all lowercase, right? And every other word after that, the first letter is starting with capitalized, right? I find that easy to read. Some people hate it, right? This is called snake casing where we use underscores. If I need to put a space in my word because I want to see that gap, then I can use underscore. Current underscore year is the way of doing that. Now, if I were to put a dash here, current minus year, that doesn't make sense. What, I'm, what am I subtracting from what? Like, huh? Rule of thumb. If you like this better, cool. Use it. If you like this better, cool. Use it. Be consistent. You're going to create something uh, with camel casing and then you're going to use it with underscore laters. JavaScript is very, very, very case sensitive. Underscore or a lowercase score is not the same thing as capital S score. So define your naming convention and stick with it. At least in that project. If you want to try another one in another project, I recommend that you love to see what is more comfortable for you, right? Exercise time. So open up a uh, var, uh, 01 var, start file. The reason, uh, so th this particular file, a little bit more complicated. The way I've structured this is I want you guys to create meaningful names. I'm going to give you max four minutes on this. Right? Replace the underscores with a name that represents the data that it holds. If you don't understand what the data that it holds, I gave you a comment on the, uh, the right-hand side of that. So, for example, line 19 is var greeting. Welcome to JavaScript. The reason I'm creating that variable is it's a nice message to the user. So I'll give you guys a couple minutes to work that out. And then when you're done, 
console log it like we see on line 28. So don't get too hung up on what the values are to the right, like what the dates are and everything like that. Just, like you said, make up a name that you think would be appropriate. Really? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Well, go to the meetup page. 
the day. Yeah, the day. The day when you know about. But I'll, yeah, I mean, so I'll, I'll send you the information. Yeah, yeah. But you said it's gonna be on a good one. Send it to me because I got it to like the GitHub.com node page and on the GitHub Heroku page, and then there's all that stuff there. Too. All right. All right. So how, all right. how, how you check out there? the GitHub node page? Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Then I started digging deeper. Okay. Good. Good, stuff, good stuff, man. Did everyone get the, the purpose of this? Like, so the, the two hardest things in computer programming is cache validation, naming things, and off by one errors. All right, if I were to, to talk about my arrays, you guys would totally get that joke and be dying uh, laughing right now. Because it was, it was, I said two things and there was three. That's the joke, right? <laughs> so naming things is hard, right? Um, one of the, uh, the exercises you cannot do often enough is uh, trying to figure out good names for something, right? Something that's meaningful and symbolic. But if you're in practice trying to do this, don't let this cripple you. So don't let this cripple you, right? Uh, if you can't na figure out a good name for something, you can spend hours on this. And I have almost gotten into fist fights with what the proper name of this is. is, is. So if you want to start a good nerd fight, talk about uh, what name it should be, or spaces versus tabs, or single quotes versus double quotes. Right, so everybody who has an IT department, just tomorrow walk through there and be like, spaces are better than tabs, and just watch the uh, insanity ensue. It's hysterical. Yeah, it's a breakout riot. It's a riot. <laughs> it's a riot. <laughs> but I, I, I told the Bill Gates answer that question from last day I made a Reddit. Okay. He said he wants everybody to use tabs. Tabs. Tabs he does everyone. Yes. <laughs> He's wrong. I hit the tab and it translates to spaces. <laughs> but on top of that, so, so the guy who created a GIF also said the wrong oh. thing, right? Oh. It's GIF. It's not GIF. Right. You're wrong. Right? <laughs> All right. So um, I'm going to call it a question. So if you were not to put seven semicolons, if you had a bunch of console outs, by console log messages. So are you talking about that? Uh, so yeah. let, let's first talk about that. Uh, can, can I get another My variable email. name? So who, who named uh, variable two? Shout out a name. What, what did you guys call the end of World War Two? War, war year end. War end. Yeah, war year end. That's fine. War date end, war year end. Mm -hmm. All right. She called it WW2 end year. Nice. WW2 end year. That's end a date. battle name, right? End Absolutely. Any future drama fan fans in here? Oh, God. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so the next spot are just future drama locations. So what, what would be a good name for my future drama locations? My future drama locations. That's, I mean, nice. All right, that's, that's fine. Cool. I mean, I call the places I want to visit, so. <laughs> Good places, everyone. Good places, everyone. Ooh, I like that one. We've got a true fan over here. We've got a true fan over here. Um, so let's just do one more. Uh, you guys are going to love JavaScript. It's a true statement now, by the way. You guys cannot not love it. <laughs> not not love. JS love. That's what I call mine, right? So uh, there's a couple ways. The whole purpose of console logs is so that way you gain some insight. I have a whole section about this, uh, and you guys will be utilizing this throughout the uh, course. Um, but the idea of a console log is to gain insight for it, right? We've already opened it up. We've seen the output in the first example. And what I want to do here is gain more insight to my code. So we could do this one of two ways. I could copy the variable and do console log and paste that in there. Or we can comma separate it. JS love. Right, so I can do one at a time, or I can comma separate the values. So if I were to open this, I'm going to comment these out just in case this throws me an error. Also, I, I want you guys to note, don't get hung up on the values that are in there. We're seeing a couple of stuff. We've seen a number. We've seen a string. We've seen a Boolean. We've seen an array. That's all stuff coming later. So if you're confused as to what information it's holding, we're going to get to that. All right. It's not the same, though, right? I'm sorry, what? It's not, it's not the same if you call it separation. 
it just the way it outputs it is a little different. Like instead of giving its own dedicated line, it does something a little different. End results kind of the same. You're seeing information that you care about your about your program, right? All right. Functions. All right. So variables, super 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 important. You can't really do anything with variables unless you have a function. Okay? Functions do something. Generally speaking, a function is a subprogram that can be called by code external to itself, right? Other terms you might hear when talking about a function is you invoke it. I'm going to ask you the question, where did you invoke the function, right? It means where did you call it? Where did you run it? Where are you triggering it? You're going to hear these terms. They all mean the same thing. Depending on who's saying, they want to sound smarter than, uh, than another person, they might use the word invoke. I'm like, where, where is this called? Where are you running this, right? So let's talk about naming functions, right? These look kind of familiar, right? We just mentioned these, right? They're practically the same thing as variables. You can start with a dollar sign, underscore, and a letter. That's it. They can have a number, but they just can't start with it. It can't be a reserved keyword. Uh, can't do the dash or the dot. Um, they're case sensitive, just like everything else in JavaScript, right? So sort apples, lowercase s, capital A, is different than capital S, capital A. That's a function. We have the function keyword. We have that symbolic name. And then we have a pair of parentheses. Then a block of code. You're going to hear this may refer to this over and over again. A block of code is the curly brackets. This block of code that's going to run is going to live between the two curly brackets. That comments of do something could be whatever sort apples is going to take to sort apples is going to live in, in between. Right? And then on the last line, this is how we're invoking it. We're referring to its name and then passing parentheses or, or, or attaching parentheses at the end. Does that make sense? Right? So the idea behind naming variables and naming functions, generally the same. Variables typically store values, they store information, and functions typically execute some code. Right? Alright, this one went real quick because exercise time. <laughs> All right, everybody, get up to jumping jacks. No, I'm kidding. I'll just go to number three. <laughs> we got Joe and Greg ready to go. We're doing a uh, every hour ten push-ups here. The space. Really? No. <laughs> we keep on saying we're going to do that this summer, but it's okay. Yeah, every hour it says we should do it. <laughs> we should make an app. All right, so go ahead and open up uh, exercise three. Or uh, exercise two, functions 101, start in the start file, open up the functions. All I want you to do is create a function name for what's happening in there. So read the comment, read the console log, what's happening in there, and what's a good function name that you can create with it. And then invoke them uh, on line 31 through 33. <laughs> All right, notice the, uh, the number of underscores represent the same number of underscores um, in the invocation. So they go in order.
So again, if you get stuck on a variable name or a function name, name it something and then move on. You know, give yourself a comment saying, come back and fix this because I'm not going to remember what this is doing, right? Or give yourself a comment explaining what this is doing, right? If you, if you look at some source code from like Facebook or Google or something, they have really long descriptive names, sometimes like 80 character long names. That is not unheard of. So don't think that your variables need to be as short and concise as possible or your function names need to be three letters long. You're not a good programmer because you have a three letter long uh, function name, right? The more descriptive you can be so someone else can come read your code, the better off you are. Because there, I can't tell you the number of times I've come back to my code six months later, forgot that I wrote it, and cursed the last guy who wrote it, and then realized it was me. <laughs> <laughs> Happens all the time. Be like, this guy doesn't know, oh, that was my, mm, mm. I make the circumstances change. I start back, <laughs> start back on it real, real quick. Cool. So any questions about variables and functions thus far, right? What the syntax of a function is, what the syntax of a variable is. Pretty straightforward at this moment, right? Now again, variables and functions are going to carry you through any programming language. There's a slight syntactical differences in other languages, all right? Next thing we have to talk about is scope. Yes. I'm sorry. I was waiting for that. Just be me. Wait for it. I was waiting for Greg. Okay. <laughs> Can't find a good scope yet, right? And the mouthwash, right? All right. So scope is the context in which values and expressions are visible or can be referenced. If a variable or other expression is not in the current scope, it's unavailable for use. Right? What this means uh, in JavaScript, there are three scopes. We have global scope, meaning everything has access to it. We have local scope, which is um, uh, everything inside of a function has access to it. And then we have block scope. So if we take a look at this, 
What would you guys assume username is? Is that a global, local, or block? Yeah. Why? Why is it a global? Because you need an analog to things for logging. It's outside the function. Regardless of the reason I need it, the what makes the global variable is outside the function. Here's one that trips everybody up. Is this function a global function or a local function? It's a global function? Why? I can call from anywhere. The fact that it's not inside of another function is what makes it global, right? This const, greeting, global or local? Local. Local? Because it's within the yeah. Because I'm within my block of code. It's local to this function, okay. right? Now, this for loop, global, local, or block? Local. Block. Block. He's, he's right. It's a block. It is within this function, but I can't access it here. Right? So the fact, again, this block of code here on the for loop, remember I mentioned block of code with functions? If statements, conditional, uh, those known as conditional statements in for loops create their own block. Right? So this variable is defined within this scope, right, of block, so therefore I cannot access it in the local function. Is like a Russian model? Yes. Let's take a look nice. at this. So a lot of, yeah, a lot, it's very much like that, yeah. But, well, but kind of like in a reverse, though. That's the, yeah. The, the other way I like to think about it is like two way mirrors, right? One way I can see in, the other way I can't, right? So the global scope has access to nothing in the local or the block, right? So that just bounces off. Local scope cannot access block scope, but it can access global, right? So, I, so local creates its own one-way mirror where global can't see in it, but I can see out. Global, local can see out. And then block can see everything. Right? So if I wanted to use greeting, I'm seeing the local, and then username, I'm seeing the global. So block can go all the way up, but local can't peer into it, nor can global. Right? So this just, just in case you aren't seeing this, I was going to say, to, between the curly brackets is where, where we're talking about this scope. So for the function, it's right here, and then right there, that curly bracket down there. But for that for loop, you have it within here and right there. So if you're not, if you haven't, like, if you're not familiar with the syntax for it, that that is where where the, the scope starts for that function specifically. Absolutely. So relook at this over and over and over again. One of the biggest things that, that catch me, uh, besides syntactical errors, like I forgot a, a quote or a semicolon somewhere or a curly bracket, is naming and scope. Right, like I've, I've either called it something and I'm using the wrong version of that something I called it, right, because case sensitive, sensitivity, or uh, I'm trying to access something in a scope I don't have access to. Yeah, you're driving yourself crazy thinking like, oh, I've done everything right, I swear, like there's something wrong with the computer, and then you, you look at it and you're like, oh, that's something wrong with me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so there's a problem in this program, right? This program runs uh, with two lines of code to fix it. With the context of what we just talked about, absorb this and tell me the right answer. Let me give you guys a minute to look over this code. I'm calling all these functions down here that I've set up right above it. It's a, a project 03 scope. I want you guys to work along with me so that way I can uh, do one more lecture before we uh, call it a night. So that means you're gonna do it right now? Or? Yeah, yeah, I want them to call it out to me. So absorb what you guys are seeing here. So look at it on, on your... And if I were to create, not you, <laughs> if I were to create two lines of code, how can I fix this program? Just there were a couple of functions that are have errors. That's, a, that's an error right there. Say it again. Number 12. The comment below are a couple of functions that are have errors. Yeah. So yeah. That's the problem right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what it is. Yeah, right there. That makes sense. Uh, it's, it's a dramatic error. But we can read that stuff anyway. Oh, I caught your English. User? User? User. All right, fine. <laughs> oh, the, the, the problem? You, you're great at cool. 
Yeah, you can tell me, right? <laughs> 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 guy, to be fair, hey. English is not his first language. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's my excuse. What is yours? English is your first language. JavaScript is my first language. Yeah, right. nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I know how to type. I can't ask keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody got an idea of what happened? I just need to, I just need to add two lines of text. What do I need to add? I'm invoking them down there. Oh, yeah. You, it, nowadays, you also have to put the code in the front. You have to define what you're going to do before you tell them to do. Most languages are that way. JavaScript, you could get away with doing back uh, something different, but now you can't. Now you do it every other way, which is you define what's going to happen before you say, make it happen. You know what? It starts from the top. Oh, I'm going to, oh, okay, I'll remember to, to do it when it's called. Okay, you want to do it? You got it. I'll do it. All right. But it sounds. So, so how, how's everybody doing? If I were to give myself a couple of lines up here, what are what are the two lines that need to be uh, need to be added here? First of all, what's the problem? Anybody got an idea? Yeah, it's undefined. Mm-hmm. The variables are undefined. So, what do I have to do to fix that? Can you see what he's saying? Right, so the answer is I create two variables, var player name and var uh, player score. Um, this might be like uh, out of the scope of like, like, <laughs> like, 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 uh, it's called hoisting. Hoisting. Um, and that's a totally separate co uh, conversation. Uh, what I recommend is put all your variables at the highest scope possible so that way. Um, you avoid confusion. Like the, the worst thing, like I, it's usually a sign of code smell to me. Like you've got variables declared just randomly throughout your very, uh, functions and your document. Hoist them all to the top yourself because JavaScript is going to do that for you. And you may have some unintended consequences by allowing JavaScript to do that for you. So, can you see what he did there? Can you also? See? I mean, I'm fit, no, I mean physically. I don't mean like. Did you understand? No, I mean like. <laughs> do you want to do Control Plus a little bit to make it a little bigger? There you go. Now you can board my glasses. Right? Good. All right, so the two lines that I needed to create was line 18 and line 19. The reason being is because I'm trying to use player name. Where's player name in the scope? It's not there. So what JavaScript is trying to do is trying to go up to the next level up, which would be the global. Where is it defined? It's not, right? Same thing here with player score. So what we're doing here in create player, which is what I'm invoking on line 33, is I just want to establish what the player's name is, right? And then I want to update the score. Right? So I've called this three times. And we can think about this in the game of, uh, in the context of a video game, right? I did something. Cool. Get 100 points. I did something else. I get 300 points. I got hit by an enemy, so I docked 200. So what this is actually doing is kind of trivial, but this illustrates the point that I write code like this all the time if I forget to establish a global scope or a scope where this has access to it, right? So if we look at this function, it's going up to the global scope to look up here. So uh, I had a question about um, where, where do I define these variables? In JavaScript, I'm just giving you a quick level, you can define them anywhere. It does this thing called hoisting where it pu uh, pushes it all to the top. Don't do that. Don't let JavaScript decide how to reorder your code. Um, put all your variables to the highest scope possible, toward the top of your scope. So if I were to define a couple of variables inside of uh, display score, I would do it on line 22 and push everything else down, right? And then here, this is the top of my document on line 18, this is, uh, and group everything together. So that way I know as a developer where everything is at, and I don't have to go hunting for this mysterious variable that's maybe declared, maybe not. Question? You said that it pushes everything to the top, does it give you a warning that it's done that? Nope. That's the fun of JavaScript. 
and that's going away. So don't, don't get don't get used to it. <laughs> yeah, with let and const, they don't do that. With variables, they do. So there, there's we're working with two versions of JavaScript now. We have the old way, ES5, and then we have everything else. ES6 is the official term that people throw around, and uh, basically high level is uh, ES5 was lacking a lot of features, right? We don't have things like variable um, uh, scoping, like block level scoping with vars. We do with let and const. We don't have default parameters, right? That's a, that's a whole thing that a lot of people coming from other languages in here and be like, that's what's wrong with JavaScript. So they complained loud enough and uh, now we have it, right? Um, and the, um, ES6 was a big dump. There was a lot of changes. So when you talk about ES6 from the old way of doing things, you have to learn a lot. But ES, they've changed the number to like whatever year it's in. So we have 2016, 17, 2018, and they introduced two new things. So once you get past the hump of learning what ES6 is and all the gloriousness that it is, each time uh, something new comes out, you only have to learn one to two things, maybe three tops. But that's a whole nother conversation. So, you with me so far? I two lines to create, uh, create it in the global scope. Um, one caveat that I want to point out is I need to instantiate this as zero. Yeah. Otherwise, it's none. None. Right? So undefined is the variable by default. So what does undefined plus 300 mean? NAN, right? You're going to see this a lot. Capital N, lowercase a, capital N. Not a number. Not a number, right? So by instantiating this as a zero, as a number, I can start adding to it. So, cool. Just a quick caveat on that. All right, one, one more exercise, oh, one more talk. Yep. So here, conditional statements. I highly recommend going over conditional statements. That's just like if, else, you know, greater than, equal to, things like that. Did all the, all the stuff in math they said we were never going to do again. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I want to talk about one more uh, uh, feature of functions, right? So I, I, I want to define what a function is, right? So as we go through things, you're going to see four different ways of seeing a function, right? Um, a function declaration is the first way, and we've already seen that. We have the function keyword, we gave it a name, and we've optionally passed in parameters, and we've optionally returned something. So in this example we see below, we have function square. Function is my keyword to de declare the function, and I gave it a name. This little doohickey in the parentheses is known as a parameter. I'm returning the multiplication of num times num. I just want to square my number. So when I invoke it, I pass in two, I get four. When I invoke it, I pass in 11, I get 121, right? So that's function declaration. Next, we have function expressions. This confuses people, and this is why I spend a lot of time talking about this, because they're fundamentally the same thing. You can effectively think about function declarations and function expressions as the same thing. But the difference are, is a function expression is a function where an expression should be. So we have const count. That's a variable, right? The right-hand side of that equal sign is we are expecting some sort of expression. I put a function in there. That's a function expression. So if a function is saved as a variable, how do I call count? I do it the same way I declared it, right? I just refer to that variable name. And that's important. That, that seems to trip people up, and I want to demystify that right now. Don't be afraid of that. If you see a function declaration or a function expression, same thing. You can effectively think about it as the same thing. The next way we can see a function expression is methods, right? We talked about that dot notation a little, a little while ago. Here's where it comes into play. We have a variable called methods. It's an object. It's between two curly brackets, right? That's called an object literal. Inside of this, I have a list of key value pairs. Left-hand side is my key, what, what's my name of it, and the right-hand side is my value. In this context, my key is called sum. And the right-hand side is an expression called function. So instead of holding sum as to be 42, I make it a function. So methods.sum is how I refer to the method and invoke it. Question? Can you use a sum because it's already a reserved function in JavaScript? Because it's not... Um, this is my syntax highlighting. Um, um, I don't think sum is a reserved word. Um, it looks like it. 
loves the cons, but it's not good. It's a good catch. In, in the first line where you say count is equal to function, can the function have a name? Or is it because it doesn't have a name that you're assigning it to const where you can call that? Yeah, you can optionally give it a name here as here well. Too, uh, but you call it by this name. Right? So that you can call it by its original name then? Uh -huh. No, because you declared it as a variable. So if you, if you console, if you log out just count without the, the parentheses, it'll just show you the function. So essentially, that's like, you know, it's the not putting, it's just moving it over. And then, you know, yeah. So. so if I had a function, if I say const count is equal to function c, and then I pass, I declare the array as an argument, mm -hmm. I can't call c anymore. No, nope, you call, call count. count. Yep. And that is the global scope. Um, it depends. It depends. Like it could not be in the global scope. Like this sum method is in the yeah, met right. So, it, but the methods is global. Yeah. It's the, nothing in how you're calling it is putting it in the scope. It's with it, when it's within the curly brackets of another yeah. function. And, and the same can be with the class or right? this particular methods. Mm -hmm. What is methods again? Methods. So methods no, are just the declaration. In this it case, it's just the name of. Oh. Yeah, it's just a, what methods is a class is an object. It's just an object. It's just an object. Okay. So we've already seen objects, right? We've already seen an object in practice. What is yeah. that? It's an object. So this object has a set of properties and methods associated with it. The method we've been using is log. So in order to see something in our JavaScript console, we call the console object dot log and invoke the function with the parentheses, right? Just like we see methods, methods is equal to uh, console here, sum is equal to log in this context, right? Everything in JavaScript's an object. At least you can think of them that so way. We, so just to clarify, so I could have function sum arg1 and arg2 also. Absolutely. I don't have to add the sum code. In the, in the context of and methods, the yes, you need, this is the syntax for methods. So I can't have, fun within the object, I cannot declare function sum num1 and num2. No, there's right? a special syntax for that. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that offline because um, ES6 brings us a new way of declaring these things. Um, but we'll talk about that I've in seen them in the chain, you know, all, I've been looking at so much stuff. So right e now. ES6 is yeah. probably what you're seeing. This is the way, because objects are just a set of key value pairs. The left-hand side is the key, which is what we're referring to here, and the right-hand side is the value. Okay. So when you refer to the key, just like when you refer to the variable, you get the value, right? Same way you do it here. All right, an arrow function uh, is defined by using a pair of parentheses that contain a list of parameters. If you, you see guys this, did a whole speech just so you can talk about this. Absolutely. So we have param1, param2, dot, 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 param n. Any guesses what I'm trying to convey here? Like what, what, what do I mean by param1, param2, dot, 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 dot param? Exactly. So when defining a function, I can define any number of parameters. So this n, param n, they just comma separate them, right? So in the, in the previous example, I gave it an array and I gave it num1, num2. Right? So again, these are variables that are, are local to this that mean something to the program later on in life. So when I pass in 5, it's going to 1. If I pass in 3, it's going to num2. All right? So arrow functions are the same thing. It's just syntactic sugar. Right? There are some cool things we can do about that uh, with like reducing the, the weight of how much uh, stuff you have to type. Right? Um, if the argument, if the uh, function only has one parameter, I don't need the parentheses around it. And it also, if my function is a one-liner, I can omit the curly brackets and the return keyword. Let's look at an example. So we have uh, const convert to, sec uh, to seconds. It takes in one argument, one parameter, milliseconds. Notice I have the curly brackets. And this is called a fat error. It's the equal greater than sign. The font I'm using is um, got special ligature. So that's why you're seeing that look nice and pretty. If you see the equal sign caret, it's the same thing. And then all I'm doing is returning milliseconds divided by 1,000, right? So I'm console logging out to convert to milliseconds. Any questions about what I'm doing here? So I've removed the function keyword, and I've added a, a fat error on the other side. Pretty straightforward, right? What am I doing there? 
we don't need anything. We are written in the list. Absolutely. So single parameter, my uh, parentheses are optional. Right? So if you see this line of code, convert milliseconds is accepting one parameter called milliseconds, and then I'm returning milliseconds divided by a thousand. So the two things that happened here is I got rid of the curly brackets and the return keyword. This is what we call an implicit return. We're just implying that the return should happen. This is called an explicit return. Why is this called an explicit return? Because I'm literally saying return, right? I'm explicitly saying that, right? So this is uh, what you'll see in the wild. This is ES6 syntax. This is starting to be in browsers more and more frequently. If you have to support um, IE, just in general, forget all the fun stuff I'm telling you. Be ready for a world of hurt. Um, this can't be used in ES6. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, IE. So um, you'll see it in the wild. And last thing you'll see, and uh, we don't have time to get into it, why we'll see this, but I'll talk about it uh, uh, quickly. Uh, a function is anonymous when it doesn't have a name. That's it. That's an anonymous function, right? Uh, where this is very useful is in callbacks, right? The reason why we can store a variable as a function or a function as a variable is because I can pass them as an argument, right? So if I wanted to... Take this right here. We have divide two. Wait, are we going to talk about uh, what I want? Okay, yes, yes. So, arguments versus parameters. Parameters are what you define when you're defining your function, right? And this could be any number, comma separated. Arguments are the data you pass into your function, right? The idea behind arguments versus parameters is it's not useful if your function does the same thing over and over again. Maybe it is. But if I want to divide two, is it useful that I'm always dividing 10 and two? No, I want to pass in two numbers and compute that outcome, right? I want to pass in one number and get the cube of whatever that number is. It's not useful to my program to always cube the number four. So what's happening here is these are my parameters and these are my arguments. My arguments are what is the data that's passed into my function. How does this work? So I'm invoking the function down here. I'm passing in 10 and 5. 10 is now num1 and 5 is now num2. And notice 4 is just num. You with me so far? Let's go down one more. So I replace my variables on the very next line. Num1 is now 10 because that's the value it holds. And 5 is num2 because that's the value it holds. Same thing with the num down here. It's 4. Notice nothing's happened down here yet. It's the very next slide. Right? So after I'm done doing the maths here, I log out the result of that. Did everyone catch that? This is the powerful part of JavaScript, right? This is the part of every programming language, right? You have a set, you have a function that's meant to do something, and you pass in information to it, right? From here, they map one for one. So 10 is going to num1. 5 is going to num2. And then we go down, we pass the information, and we console log it out, right? So callbacks. This is the last topic I'm going to talk about today, and it's super important. Callback is a function that's passed as an argument. That's it. So we have a function that we're going to pass into as an argument. It is important to note, I love making these analogies, all callbacks are functions, but not all functions are callbacks. Just like all bourbon is whiskey, but not all whiskey is bourbon. Love it. <laughs> right? Uh, so, so that, that means only when a function is passed as an argument is when it's known as a callback. So, who here has seen that annoying little pop up saying, no, do something with it, right? That's the alert. So that's a function that you have access to all over the place, right? So, what I want to do here is I want to alert hello plus my username. So, what's going on here is I have a function or a, a variable called cb, a parameter, and a, a parameter called username. I'm passing in one to one. I'm changing my function. So now CB down here is now alert. And I'm passing in Jermbo. So now I'm going to get the alert. Hello, Jermbo. That's what's going to come up. The alert is the callback. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's look at another example. So 
this is where anonymous functions come into play, right? Because typically, I'm going to make an anonymous function when handling event listeners, right? I listen for a click button, a uh, click on a button. I'm going to pass in a, a uh, callback, right? So again, we have CB and username, and this time I'm passing in a function here to here. Notice the commas over here, right? What's happening? I'm passing a reference to my function, and I'm passing in the string Jermbo. I'm invoking that function with the string of hello. Notice my function down here always accepted a message. That's how I get the message. And then that's how I console, right? So this anonymous function is being passed up here. I'm doing something in between greet user. When I'm done doing what I need to be doing, I invoke function, uh, which is this anonymous, and I'm passing in the string hello, Jermbo. Right, so that was passing the anonymous function. This is doing the exact same thing, but passing a, what is this called? Fun, but what type of function is it? Callback. It is a callback, but not yet, right here. It's a function declaration, right? Because I have, I'm declaring function and giving it a name, all right? Here, it's known as a callback, but up here, it hasn't been a callback just yet, right? So again, we log stuff. Right, which is name of my function, pass in Jermbo, uh, log stuff changes, Jermbo changes, it accepts the message, and then it alerts the message, or console log in this case. Right? So again, functions do something. It may be useful if they did the one thing over and over, like if they divided you know, 10 by 5 over and over again. It may be useful for your program, but typically not. So how do you change that? You accept parameters and you pass it in arguments. Right, And the fact that arguments, uh, functions can be passed as arguments is what makes JavaScript powerful, right? And that's called a callback. There's an exercise with that, so we'll close out with this if everybody wants to open up their exercise and just kind of finish it out. It says five, guys. Yep, I, I skipped ahead a few, so go ahead to number five. this shit where it's not hard coded. You know what I mean? Like if right. you're just manipulating the DOM and you think that you're catching the HTML or something like that in the JavaScript. Okay. And then you're pulling the data from the input fields and you're playing with the objects and all that stuff. I think it's easier to understand it from that perspective. Like it's the actual okay. as the hard coded hard coded stuff gets the classes. Well, I, I would say quite the opposite. It sounds like a, a, that, that would be like it's hard to understand that you're grabbing part of the website, changing it, manipulating it, and putting it back. Okay. And it took me forever to understand the fact that some of these things are built in, right? Yeah. They're only the JavaScript compiled, right? right. It, it confuses you more than that hard code in my opinion than it does just playing with the objects, the, with the database, and back to the HTML. But they're like trying to do that. They're trying to do it on purpose. So it, it, they're saying, if you I was passed a 5, and I was passed a 2, and the function were to add the 2, it would be much difficult is much more difficult is what if you read an input from the keyboard and let me show you how to do that and then once you got that wait a minute at the end you just got a five and a two and you're adding the two together that's what they're trying to do it's true it's true But but put in the mechanics class, don't they grab a motor? It's not in a car. I know, but if you and I, I have not. If you and I were to go to mechanic class, we would probably walk in and see a motor, and we would start working the motor. What you're saying is no, no, no. Let me drive, and as the car is driving, I'll change the oil. But that, but but that's not it, right? No, 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 no. What, what, it, what they're saying is, I understand what you're saying. What it's like, where does five come from? But what they're trying to say is, it, it can come from an input. It can come from some other service calling you. It can come from a field. 
It can come from a counter that counts every second and gets to five and then boom, calls your thing. But the important thing that when you get a five, you want to do something about it. And some, so for, for I think for other people, it's, it's hard to understand like, yeah, but what does it mean to pacify? Like when I get a five, what happens? And that's what he was saying. That's what he did. He was saying like the five, when you call it here, it goes up to there, replaces the variable, and that's really a five that goes down here and puts it all the fives over here. And then now what they're trying to do is trying to make it easy. But it sounds like you already got it. It's confusing to me that they think, and to me that's harder. It's weird. It's like, that's amazing. It's the more difficult thing to come easy to me, I think, in general understanding. Okay. Really it, okay. Okay. Dog, okay. I'd rather be hands on because, yeah, to me it's like when I'm looking at it, where's the data coming from? Like, I'd rather right. know that it's coming out of the reach of the database, and it's pulling it back in, or it's coming from the input field, it's coming from the HTML somewhere, you know. But like, when you. But when you need to learn to add two things together, you need to figure out how to add together. Forget about, let me explain to you now how a database works. Let me just show you how to add things together. Like the plus does this. In other languages, for example, the plus does different things, right? I use a period in other languages. Or, but, oh, but this one, the period does something else. So if you're coming, you want to understand sort of the core, that will give you the idea of what, um, from the core, you can you can start growing bigger and all that. And it sounds like you want to start. No, no, no. I want to hear a website. That's fine. But for example, then it's going to be difficult to go and say, "Perfect, just make a function, do that." And you're like, "What's a function?" And I'm like, "Wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I need to now explain to you the core." And you're like, "No, no, no, no. Give me the expense, the hard stuff." It's like, "Fine, you do the function." You're like, "What's a function?" Right. No, but you're, I agree with that because I went through this process of learning it on a hard coded level, and it took me a long time to like. Right, right, right. You know, like hands on, like this actually works. Yeah. I would have been like, all right, I would have spent so much time understanding how it works. Yeah. Make it work, right? I mean, yeah. I don't know, that's just how my mind works, but I get the idea of like this theoretical, you know, hard coding process. No, what, what they're trying to do is they're not trying to give you the theoretical. They're trying to explain to you what's happening but in the core, in, in the basics, right? So what a function is, what scope is, what a variable is. If you don't need that, it's not that it's a different way of thinking that you have, it's that you're maybe above that. But you have to understand that, right? If I, if I define a variable, because I could define a variable, my wife is taking in introductory programming courses, and hers was calculate the number of hours, the number of seconds in a particular hour that's entered. So I enter 45 in an input. I'm, I'm not, there's no number, someone says, Number hours equals 45. And I say, you know, input, number of hours, 45. I press enter. She has a variable that says number of hours in a second, number of seconds in an hour equals 8,600. 8, so that's hard coding. And that's real life, right? The, the, in, in, in my code in real life, there's a ton of stuff that's hard coded. Not, not the majority. You're right. The majority comes from a database. It comes from the user entering information. From it, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. But you have to understand that there are sometimes variables that are they're called, called constants, and that are always five. In the example that we used earlier, right? So it's not. Don't don't get too confused with that. Just say, let's pretend it wasn't, you know, constant number of seconds in an hour equals 8,600. You're like, I want to want that from the database. It's like. That never changes, so I don't need to pull that from the database. So I'm going to just write in the code. But just, it doesn't matter if it came from the database, it came from this, it's all the same. Once it's in there, it doesn't really exist as an equal sign. It exists as the number, and it floats around the bubble of the code. And then when it lands somewhere, you're either going to read it and write it to the database, read it and calculate something from it, read it and display it on to the user, and you're going to do those things that you want to do. But just for now, because they want to explain things that perhaps you already understand completely, they need to say, explain this to number two people. So let's, everybody understands one plus two. So I don't have to explain that to you. So I'm going to use that knowledge you have to explain you something like a function. Why in the world would I make a function called 
add two numbers together that's silly. He's going to do that. It's not because it's going to be ever useful to you. You will never use it. But because you know the answer already to 1 plus 2, you already know. Exactly. So you would never do a function like that. You would do it in the line that you're doing the calculation with, but in, it's a way to describe something. Later on, your function will be 300 lines long, and they'll do a bunch of different uh, interesting things, and they will return promises, and they will return this, and will return that. Until then, let's just start with a goofy, simple function, and to emphasize even more that it doesn't matter what's what, what, if it's five, cool. If it's six, cool. If it's seven, cool. Let's start with just, let's all agree that it's five. So that I don't go, obviously the answer is ten. And you're like, but wait a minute, professor. Mine weren't five times two. My numbers were seven and four. Okay, okay, okay. In your case, it would be 28. But, and professor, wait, wait, wait a minute. So that we can all agree upon, he defines hard-coded what those variables are. Learning the code. Yes, so learning how... I, I was thinking about it, it's always a start and end curly brackets. Now the editor will help you with this. Because you can literally... No, 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 not because... It, it, it does do that, sometimes there's a line. Forget about that. Highlight one of the quotes, either the beginning or the end quote, the, the curly brackets. Any one of those. Highlight it, as in, you know, with your mouse. Look around, your editor will highlight the, the ending one. Or the beginning one, yes. So you can just go like, what's this ending? Highlight it, and the other one will highlight it. Ah, but you can just simply highlight one and say, okay, well, that one's okay, so that one's not it. Highlight this one, that's okay, that's not it. Then you can say, okay, that one, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, you're, you're right, you're, and you're right, you're right. And I think, I think that's why in this, class he wants to for everybody to use the same editor not because it's the better one not because it's the best one it's good but because if he says look at this and you're like it doesn't show on mine because my editor isn't set up or or set that way he, he can't be like all right everybody else hold on while we work on this editor no let's all work on the same editor so that it's simpler and all that but again if we chose a different editor cool as long as you all have the same one, then it would eliminate different problems. Because those kind of editor problems you can you can have with me, like personally, like you know. Let, let's all sit down and say, well, I, I can do this. How come you can't do that? Oh, no problem, no problem. I can do that. Like they were saying, how come Visual Studio can't do the things that WebStorm could do? It can with the right plugins or the right settings or in the right place or in a different way, right? I just wanted to briefly uh, hit on a couple points um, before everyone goes. Uh, one, very clearly, Palm Beach Tech. This is our mission statement, building the Palm Beaches into a tech hub. That's why we're all here. That's why I hope you guys are here to learn about technology and be a part of that uh, industry and being a part of that movement. So getting that out of the way, um, this is a phone number. Oh, wow. So I don't know if anyone has a phone. If you have a phone, raise your hand. <laughs> okay, good. Everyone has a phone. Great. Um, text us your email to this phone number. 
we want to be able to follow up with everybody uh, about not only the WinCode class that we're going to be holding here in a couple weeks, but also more about what's going on uh, in technology here in the Palm Beaches. We have some events that are pretty consistent that we do all throughout Palm Beach County. If you guys are looking to hear more about a certain topic or a certain um, bit of technology, blockchain, cybersecurity, whatever the case, uh, there are some really interesting things. But most importantly, uh, we're gonna follow up with some more information about uh, the WinCode course. Uh, quick overview on that. It'll start here in a couple weeks here at the Palm Beach Tech Space. Jeremy is gonna be facilitating leading that course. Uh, it's a partnership between our organization, the Palm Beach Tech Association, and WinCode Academy, which is based in um, Miami. They are a coding school that's been around for the past uh, four years. I've had uh, several dozen cohorts go through and they have a 91% placement rate of everybody who goes through their program to get a job in computer coding or web development of some sort. So they are really good uh, and they are great partners. The gentleman who's overseeing the program, Tim Reen, was actually the teacher of the year in Palm Beach County uh, in the school district and went over to WinCode to learn coding, and now he's focused on teaching coding himself. Uh, so we have some really great roots for that program here. It's 12 weeks, uh, three nights a week, 6.30 to 9.30, right here at the Palm Beach Tech Space. Uh, there's also uh, a, uh, another program going on at the same time in Boca Raton as well. So if you are more closer to the Boca Raton area, there's that opportunity. Um, with that, the course does cost $4,000. I will preface, um, the bigger conversation saying there's financing available uh, very simply it, through a uh, organization called Climb uh, that we've uh, that WinCode is partnered with and Palm Beach Tech is partnering with uh, Career Source Florida. So if you work at a company that's interested in giving you guys uh, professional development experience or workforce training, they can get up to 75% off the cost of that for you. So essentially, if uh, you go to your boss and say, hey, I want to take this course develop my skill sets, it will only cost us a thousand dollars at the end of the day. That's a really good um, opportunity and we've wow. worked with a lot of our uh, partner companies to be able to facilitate that. So that's a little bit more. Everybody please take out your phone 561-250-7206. Do that now. I will give somebody before they leave here a t-shirt. I know. Big deal. Whoop. Whoa. Uh, right? We're, we're, we're giving away the store today. Bust out the t-shirt can. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. You know what? There was something about liability of having a t-shirt cannon indoors. I don't know what happened with that idea. So but that got lightning. shot down. <laughs> yeah. So again, 561-250-7206. Um, but that's uh, everything I have. Jeremy, I don't know if you had anything. Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah. Anything else you want to say about... Uh, in fact, you'll be teaching two weeks? Um, no, I'll be teaching. Thank you. Come on. Check out, <laughs> check out the Palm Beach Tech you? Talk events. Check out the uh, Bokit JavaScript and the Palm Beach JavaScript events as well. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys so much for coming out. And oh, any... also, we have a, a JavaScript meetup here, which is uh, my monthly JavaScript meetup that's going on. So it's uh, Eddie Garcia is going to be talking about how to bootstrap business with Vue.js. Next week. Next week, here. Yeah. So the following week after that, on these yeah. JavaScript, sign up and uh, yeah. So thank you guys so much, Damian, Jeremy, myself. We'll be here if you guys have any other questions. Feel free to hang out. Finishing that up and like going to the editor, right? So you know, I deployed um, the basic thing in a Heroku, right? Yep. It'll get uh, connected by GitHub. Perfect. Right, right. So th there's a couple of things. So there is, and this is an important difference. Let me just pause. So, GitHub.